Hello everyone, my name is Marie Dillon. Um, I'm the Health Development Officer for Irish in Britain. So as many of you probably are aware of, we were due to launch our Mental Health and Wellbeing Charter last week, but of course, due to circumstances, that didn't quite happen. However, I'm joined today by Connor Stowe from Enterprise Ireland. Now, Connor was actually due to speak at our launch to share his kind of his own personal journey with mental health. So all's not lost, we've managed to embrace technology and Connor is joining me today. So Connor, thanks very much for getting on. Thanks, Mary Marie. No, it's great to be with you. No, I mean, thank God for Zoom and all this technology. We're we're kind of learning, the yeah. learning the hard way. Getting into I know, it. yeah, yeah. I'd say eighty percent of my day is video calls in some way, shape, or form with work and these house party apps and stuff like that. So uh, yeah, listen, we're getting better at it. I think exactly. So Connor, you're working with Enterprise Ireland at the moment. Yeah, Marie, I'm working with Enterprise Ireland over in London, so helping Irish companies in consumer goods, clean tech, and paper printed packaging to export into the UK market. So, uh, yeah, it's a good job. Challenging at the moment. I'm actually back in Ireland with my family during isolation, which is nice in many ways, but also um, it is a challenging time for clients. So uh, there's definitely a bit of, you can feel stress in the air with some of them, but, you know, a lot of them, like we were talking before the call, your your brother is working with a company in, in Galway that's doing incredibly well out of the situation, helping the HSE and NHS through building ventilators. So there's some good stories and bad stories. There are. And I suppose, you know, we we're also talking as well about it's not just businesses, of course, that are affected. It's individuals as well and our mental health and our well-being and you know, it's, it's Stress Awareness Month in April. So, I mean, I think stress is something we're all probably dealing with at the moment. And I know you've had your own kind of challenges with that. Has this kind of crisis brought up anything for you or, you know, how, how is it panning out? Yeah, I, I think I've adapted to it quite well, but it's definitely taken me a few days or maybe, you know, a week or two weeks to really settle into a routine that works for me. I think um, it's hard to not get pulled to the negative news that's coming from around the world and stories of deaths and illness and unemployment um, and business closures. But what I'm trying to do is just limit my worries to what's in my control. So for me, in my own personal life, my main concerns are obviously my grandparents and then my dad, who's a business owner, and then my girlfriend, who's a nurse. And... I tried to see what I can actually do for them. And really it's about being there for, for kind of moral and emotional support and just send the messages to say that I love them and I care for them and I, you know, I'm there for them and that I, you know, whatever happens, I, I'm proud of them and that type of thing. And um, now that I have that kind of pattern and to be honest, I'm making the most of the extra couple hours in bed and I'm getting my yoga in and mindfulness in. So I'm adapting quite well, but there are times still that I get dragged into you know, that, that more stressful and mad world outside of my, of my own immediate world. And Connor, do you think, I know I mentioned at the start, you've had your own journey kind of with your mm. mental health challenges. Is, do you think your experience is kind of helping you now or what kind of journey did you go through? Yeah, I, I can touch on that. So um, I suppose I've been dealing with my own journey of anxiety and depression for the last three years now. Um, and it probably what it probably is a longer journey than that, but my my own kind of um, conscious journey has been about three years, and it started uh, when I, I had a lot of injuries playing sport. I was I was a hurler and a footballer, and I played for Plunkett, the Brogans Club in the Navan Road, which people might be familiar with. And um, over time, I, I I just had too many hip injuries and. I had surgery on my hips and eventually I just needed to retire. So I was 20 years of age and I was finished the sport that, that I loved and, and was very driven to succeed in. And after that, I, I did feel a big difference almost immediately, but I, I maybe tried to put on the back burner because I had a big holiday planned with some friends in Southeast Asia. And I kind of was like, right, well, that's, I'll, I'll put my energy into that that's a positive thing. You know, I'll drink and I'll party and I'll travel and I'll forget about that, that issue. And, and these feelings I'm feeling in the interim will go away. But it turned out that, you know, that was the worst thing I could have done where I bottled things up. I didn't talk about my issues, but I tried to push them away. 
and you know drinking and being in the middle of no you know in a completely unnatural area for me you know a pure dub true and true going through you know the back alleys of asia and you know that's when i had my first panic attack um i was on in an island off the coast of thailand and you know i, I was dehydrated and i think i was just overwhelmed by what was going on around me and i had my first panic attack didn't know what it was and that ended up being the first of many throughout the rest of the trip and it took that moment for me to realize that there was something wrong and i did need help and ever since then i've been trying to kind of unlock the issues in the lead up that caused that situation for me and initially i probably thought oh it was just because i was away and then i came back was like i'll do a few counseling sessions and then it turned out that it wasn't just you know that was just the tip of the iceberg you know there was a lot of ice underneath the water and i had to go back through many many years of of you know my 20 year life and just delve through issues like my parents separation various deaths and heartbreaks and that type of thing to find out what my where my issues lay and to to really come to terms with what was going on with me and that this anxiety and depression wasn't something that was in a particular moment that it's something that is going to be connected to me for the rest of my life and it's just how i manage it and how i process the things that i deal with to make sure that it doesn't limit me in in, in whatever way i can so connor like when it was when you kind of realized okay this is more mm. than just you know the regular kind of stress or it, it does something bigger here how did you go about finding help how did you did you ask somebody or how did all that happen so i think initially i was kind of forced into asking for help because when you're having panic attacks it does feel like you're going to die even though how you know insane it might sound it does feel like that because yeah technically there's nothing going on with your body that would lead to that but in the moment i was feeling shortness of breath i was sweating i, I couldn't stop moving i couldn't stop worrying it felt like i was going to pass out and that's a very scary moment so straight away then my friends noticed something was wrong and i think the first part of my journey was probably discussing with them the three friends three amazing friends that i went on this trip with and talking with it talking about this stuff with them and luckily not everyone will have this but my mom's actually a psychotherapist so i called her up and started to discuss with her and she found me a counselor that i could see that she kind of knew of through her training that was well regarded for people of my age and i had a counselor set up for when i was going home so i was lucky in that sense i don't think it can it's that straightforward for everyone but I think there was years where I probably was unhappy without even knowing it and didn't ask for help when I took having that moment of, of, of near death in my, in my mind and to, to result in me actually asking for help. I know. And I suppose we always hear about the importance of speaking up and reaching out and, you know, hindsight's a great thing, obviously, as we know, but when it came to actually your friends and your family what kind of reactions were there were you kind of how did you feel about talking about this were you scared i know some people there's a lot of stigma around mental health and mm. depression anxiety so how did that pan out i think there, there are stages to it and there's probably categories that i can fit people into um my friends i i had no issue with it um and what i found was that they actually kind of thought something was up with me for longer then I knew anything about this stuff and they were great. My family telling my mom was fine, telling my, my siblings was fine. The scary one for me was telling my dad because I think a lot of Irish people and, and, and British people can connect to this. It's just um, parents of a certain generation, especially males, just don't understand um, what anxiety or depression might mean. They might feel it and they might not just be able to identify that that is what they're feeling and i went to my dad and i told him initially that i had anxiety because that's it i was going on this journey in counseling and working out things for myself and i told him and it was on the phone and he he said to me um you know what are you anxious about and i was like no 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 i'm not anxious about anything in particular it's you know it's this condition this is how it kind of manifests itself these are things that trigger it 
and it just didn't really make sense to him and, and he was kind of it was more of a kind of like ah, shake it off like you know what do you have to be worried about you're you're doing really well in college and I know you've had to give up sport but I can get you a goalkeeper's hurl and you can go and goal and stuff like that and it was stuff it was his way of trying to help but it for me it just probably made me feel a bit ashamed of of my conditions and then over time with counting I started to realize that the anxiety was was only one part of it and then the other part was depression and that was probably harder for me to actually deal with as well and accept that that I was depressed I thought there was probably even more of a self stigma with that yeah and then I told him after I told everyone else at this stage I I'd met I started going out with my girlfriend as well and she's a nurse and she was brilliant for all this stuff so again she fell into that easy to talk to category and I told herself and my friends again and my mom and then I, I told my dad and he goes listen so I, I can accept the anxiety but I can't accept the depression you know I don't think you're depressed and uh, I went back at him and, and that's when I kind of you know got a bit angry and, and rightfully so where I said to him listen I've been in counseling for four months working this out you know I didn't just come up with this today it's not because I'm feeling sad today it's because I've I've probably haven't felt happy for many many months and the anxiety and the depression are so closely related it's not one thing and not the other and I sent him on articles I sent him on books and videos and I was like listen study this come back to me when you know more about it because I'm not going to argue with you when you don't know anything about it and my dad's one of these people who he does he's very reflective and when he doesn't understand something initially if you challenge him he will go away and work on it and he started doing his own research and um you know there was a lot of going back and forth and him getting improvement but then me pushing him further and further and eventually now it's at the stage where where he asks me how i am all the time and he he's very proud of the work i do in the mental health space and shares it with with friends, family, colleagues, and stuff like that. And, and he's nearly proud to have a son who's going through this stuff, but is able to talk about it and he sees what the benefit is. And um, yeah, that would, be, that would be the big thing for me, I think. Um, most people find, but like what a lot of people would think, my dad was a challenge, but I think I, I've cracked him at this stage. But not to say, no, that does take a lot of mind space. So, you know, that's something in itself that it can cause more anxiety and, and make you feel even more down when you're going through that and challenging people. I can imagine. And as part um, yeah, of obviously as your counselling, you were doing that as part of your recovery and part of your journey. Was there anything else that you started to do or what other kind of sources of support or how else did you, you start to kind of piece things together and, and make on, on, on the road to recovery? Um, sorry. And I think, yeah, so first for me was the counseling. And through that, I learned a lot of stuff because my counselor pointed me in the right way to find various resources. So I think counselor is, is a great starting block for anyone. If you can get a good psychotherapist and go in and through their studies, they know what helps a human to, to, to kind of heal themselves and to cope. Um, the next step for me was probably a few months in, I, I I, I'd done mindfulness before I had the Headspace app, but it was very half-hearted um, and I probably didn't have a full understanding of the science behind it. And I am quite a logical person and knowing something like that, knowing the actual direct benefits and, and the science behind benefits um, really helped me to commit to something. So the next phase was my, my mom's boyfriend actually bought me this book um, called Mindfulness, Finding Peace in a Frantic World. And it's a, it's a fantastic book. I'd recommend it to anyone. And what I, it, it, first half of the book just kind of explains what mindfulness is, is, how it works. And then after that, it gives an eight-week mindfulness course. And it gives you a mindfulness activity, and then it gives you a day-to-day -day task that you're supposed to do mindfully. So it could be brushing your teeth mindfully or planting a little um, flower out the back and watching it grow or whatever it might be. And you do this for eight weeks and you kind of put it down in the journal and stuff and keep up with your progress. And I did that. And that was a game changer for me, I think, where I started to get these little, these little tools that could help balance me out when I felt a little bit off. Mm -hmm. um, little mindfulness exercises 
and meditations like um, body scans and three minute breathing spaces and loving kindness meditations. And this stuff that in all the mindfulness study, because now I've trained with the British and Irish Mindfulness Institute, it's all stuff that I'm doing again and again and again. It always pops up. And that book literally had pretty much everything in there. So mindfulness was the next big step for me. And then along that journey then as well, I obviously um, did my yoga and I tried um, some uh, alternative therapies that I find quite good, like acupuncture and um, massage and craniosacral therapy. And I think then over time through my cancer, the big thing for me, and it's not any activity, it's just learning to take time for myself um, having weekends off and having evenings to myself. These are the big things. So between therapy, mindfulness, alternative therapies, uh, yoga, and then just having time off, that's kind of been my, been my uh, strategy really through this, through these last, you know, probably two and a half years. So it's been a big change for you. It's, I mean, it's incredible yeah. what you've done and a lot of the stuff you're speaking about in terms of the mindfulness, the breath work, yoga, they're things I try to incorporate myself. And when you mention as well about taking time for yourself and having your weekends or your evenings or, or whatever the case may be, I guess now the situation a lot of us are finding ourselves in is we've so much time, we're not sure what to do with it at the mm. moment. Um, and I mentioned to you when we spoke before about my, myself and I find having a morning routine really important for my mindset my mental health that kind of thing and um, what do you what would you recommend or what would your kind of top tips be for people going through maybe changes now whether it's working from home maybe they're out of work I know there's a lot of you know uncertainty and a lot of pressure on people at the moment yeah yeah it is very difficult and I think people need to if they're feeling a little bit off through this time to just give themselves a you know a virtual hug and be like this isn't my fault. Um, you know, this, this is, this is an unusual circumstance for everyone. And it's a challenging circumstance for everyone. And what I feel now isn't how I'm always going to feel. And I just need to get through this as best I can. Um, because there's a lot of guilt involved with, with mental health issues. I find with my anxiety and depression, there's always a lot of guilt. Even now, if I feel it today, I probably feel guilty about it, even though I know logically it's not my fault. So people just need to recognize that and you know, give themselves a smile and be like, listen, I'm doing the best I can. Um, I think what I would recommend to people, and this is the biggest thing that I've had to work on over the course of, of my journey with mental health, is being comfortable with resting and staying still. Because for me, I grew up in an environment where if I was playing PlayStation games or if I was sitting around the house or lying in, I'd get given out to because you know, I should be doing this, you know, I, I'd have jobs made up for me. I should be playing sport and hanging out with friends and then doing the garden and then sweeping and then going off to see my grandparents and this, this, and this, and this, and this, and go study. And, you know, that's why, that's like where a lot of my issues came from was just this desire to always be busy and be successful in whatever I do. And it's just very tiring. And it took me probably up until the last kind of year. So it took me at least two years to just get more comfortable and to enjoy my own relaxation and being able to sit down and just maybe it's do nothing maybe I just sit there maybe I listen to a podcast maybe I listen to some music and I'm not moving and we're going to have to be doing a lot of that over the next while and if you can learn to be comfortable with that that'll be huge for you going forward because when we say take a rest and take time through yourself we don't mean or I don't mean necessarily having to go to the gym and do a big workout and then hang out with friends. It might just be an evening where you do absolutely nothing. And that sounds harder than, than, than it, you know, that's it. That is harder than it sounds in, in many ways. So if you're able to do that, it would be huge. And, and ways you can do that is, is doing some of the mindfulness exercises. That I'm sure we'll talk about a little bit later on. Um, I can completely agree with you, Connor. I'm, I think I'm still learning to do that is to be able to, without that guilt, unwind and relax, kind of to stop myself from always needing to feel like I need to be on the go all of the time. Now, you mentioned meditation. And mm -hmm. that's something that I've started doing myself. And now I'll admit I was a skeptic to begin with. And I, I think it was because I couldn't figure out how it all worked and I didn't really know which one worked for me or how to do it properly. But since I found one that does work for me and started doing it on a 
consistent basis. I find it like you mentioned about having that tool or little kind of tool in your back pocket to help you when you do feel stressed. It's something that I found very beneficial. Um, what's your take on that? Yeah, like not all exercises work for everyone. So there is a lot of trial and error with this. Yeah. For me, I like really practical, short mindfulness exercises. Uh, you know, I find some of the longer, if you go onto YouTube, you might find these like error body scans where you're lying down forever and my mind just goes wandering. I'll probably end up asleep or, you know, or I'll end up cutting it short. The ones that I'll, I'll go through a couple with you later on, they're really just kind of five to 10 minute exercises that I like exercises that I can do while I'm sitting at my desk and work. Mm -hmm. and at home so a lot of these things are things that you can do your eyes closed your eyes open and just take a few seconds to yourself yeah you can breathe heavily but no one will think that you're you know you've lost this um so a lot of these i just do on the way in on the tube and stuff like that so that's what works for me but other people might like those longer meditations maybe they like meditations with movement in them there's you know um stretch meditations there's walking meditations but also there are those seated and sit, uh, lying meditations and it's just working out what type, what instructor you like, whether you like music in the background or not, whether you like sitting down, lying down or moving, and then also what type of length works for you. And that's why I think, you know, some resources like Headspace um, work out quite well because you do have those introductory courses that are, are great breakways into uh, some more advanced mindfulness and meditation. Brilliant. I agree. I think the one I finally found that worked for me, it's a five or 10 minute one. You can kind of do it as long for as long or as little as you like. And it's, as, again, you can do it at your desk or whatever. And it is finding what works for you really, because we are all unique. So Connor, um, it's been really brilliant to speak to you and thank you for being so open and honest and it's, it's been great but where can people find you i know you're you kind of have a blog and you're in this space so how can people find you and connect yeah so i have my blog i have two podcasts and then i have uh, just the social media connected to those so the website to get the blog is a mental health journey.com and then through there you can get access to the blogs and the podcasts so the podcast you can get on on any of the main podcast streaming platforms and it's one is a mental health journey and that is just talking about my main my main experiences of anxiety and depression in various settings so it could be about therapy or work or alcohol or caffeine or, or social media mm -hmm. whatever it might be and then i have my mindfulness podcast where i do short mindfulness meditations and exercises and that's a mental health journey forward slash mindfulness um and all the social media and email are up on the website as well Thank you so much for that, Connor. And I wonder, do you want to, maybe we could finish up with a demonstration of one of your mindfulness sure. meditations? Yeah, of course. So um, first of all, thanks, Amin, for, for having me on. And it's great to share with the Absolute Irish community pleasure. in the UK, um, given that I'm, I'm one that's just off the boat, pretty much in relative <laughs> terms. So I'm happy to contribute in whatever way I can. So uh, this meditation, it's, it's short and it's effective because... It helps us to recognize that we're all connected in the world and that we all need to show compassion to the rest of the world and to ourselves and to just remind ourselves that whatever's going on, it's going to be okay. So what I'd like everyone to do is to just take a deep breath in for five seconds. Hold for two and breathe out for five seconds. And when comfortable, you can either close your eyes or just lower your gaze. And what I'd like you to do now is repeat in your mind these three sentences after me. And after each one, I'd like you to take a deep breath in and out. So let's begin. May I be loved. May I be happy. May I be at peace.
So really let those words settle within you and then we'll move on to the next step. So next I'd like you to picture a loved one in your head. Maybe it's a parent or grandparent, a partner, a friend or a child. Whoever it is, just try your best to picture them in your mind right now. These are people that we're probably concerned for at this time. So I'd like you to do the same thing and repeat in your head and breathe in. May they be loved. May they be happy. May they be at peace. And now lastly, I'd like you to picture someone else in your head. And this person is just someone you might come across in your day-to-day -day life. You don't know them, but maybe you see them or you've come across them once or twice. Maybe it's a frontline worker at this time or someone who might be affected by the current crisis. This might be a little bit harder, but just try to picture them now and repeat after me and breathe in may they be loved may they be happy may they be at peace Lastly, just say, this is not our fault. It's going to be okay. And now to finish, just breathe in for five seconds. Hold for two. And breathe out for five. And that's that. Wow. Thank you. I think that said it all, Connor. Thanks again. And thanks everybody for joining us. And as I said, we'll post links to Connor's blogs and website underneath. And if you have any questions, please feel free to get in touch. And I look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you, Connor. Thanks, William Marie.